All right. We are here for another episode of Bright Girls in Business. And I am so, so excited to have my guest for today, Ms. Laura Wise. And she's so beautiful and radiant. Look at her. She just... <laughs> Yes, so she is the founder of Content Wise Communications, and she is the founder of the Black Female Freelance Network, and she has a whole bunch of stuff on this resume, y'all. She's phenomenal. Y'all know I don't bring anybody shabby on my show. They, you know, everybody comes on here, got something to say and something behind them, and so I'm uh, eager to talk to her today about building a business that has social impact. Um, and I am, I'm just really excited because the topic that we're going to talk about, especially kind of delving into uh, the Black Female Freelance Network kind of hits home with me as I was telling her off camera, is that uh, I started my career, most of my career has been as a freelancer, and that is what led me to brand myself, and that is how we got to this point and it turned into Bright Girl Media, so it, immediately when I saw that, it just stood out to me because I know how lonely it can be as a black female freelancer. So, so tell me, you know, what made you really kind of get into this space and see this need and say, you know, let me, let me serve the people. Yeah. Um, honestly, like what you just said was exactly why it was, it was lonely. I have been a freelancer for the past 11 years. Um, I have since spun off and I have a, a company uh, that I kind of am a solopreneur under. I contract out with other freelancers. Um, but, you know, I went through a lot of mistakes. I had a lot of lost money to the government. You know, I, um, you know, just had so many issues going through my freelance journey um, that no one was really there to tell me about. I also think there's something really unique about being a black woman freelancing just because of all of the things that we know are happening in society and just, you know, all of the energy around, <laughs> around black womanhood. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, I thought it would be a good idea. I mean, you know, honestly, um, it, it wasn't completely all my idea. I would say in the very beginning, it was me and a friend that were kind of trying to figure out something to do for black women. Mm. Uh, that kind of fell off and we just never did anything with it. But the idea always stuck with me and I, and I had to resurrect it. And it, it turned into kind of this new space, which was uniquely for freelancers. I think what we were trying to do was not necessarily for freelancers, but I just, it was necessary and uh, I wanted to, to create it. I love that. I love it. Um, because like I said, any, first of all, anything that speaks to black women Black women entrepreneurship, Black women empowerment, all this stuff. I just, you know, I just lean into that space because I know um, how lonely it can be or how uh, misconstrued our experience can be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, you go, especially as a freelancer, this is my experience. I don't know if you've had the same, but when you're a freelancer, you're basically going in as a contractor to do a specific project for a specific amount of time. Um, and so you're not really an employee of the company, but you know, you're contracted by the company. So a lot of times you're not protected by the same things that employees will be protected by. Uh, you know, you can't just go to HR and <laughs> complain about certain things because HR is not there really to serve you as a contractor. They're there for their employees. And so, um, a lot of times your voice does not get heard in those spaces. You're, you're, you're kind of there to be, um, you know, to get a result and yeah. not to be seen or heard in a way, right? You're like kind of behind the scenes. <laughs> and so um, tell me about the support system that you provide for women who, you know, show up in our experience. Like what does the, uh, the network do? Yeah, so I will say we are new <clears throat> and we are growing. This is a passion project that I just, I feel so strongly about um, that I want to continue to put energy in. Um, but right now it's just a community of different women really all across the world. I will say that's one thing that I, I didn't really expect when I started the BFF network um, is for it to span internationally. But there are black women in 
across the UK, there are Black women in Europe, there are Black women based in Africa who are, are freelancing. And I was really surprised, I would say, to be able to tap into those women as well. But, um, you know, there's so many questions, especially I would say if you're a new freelancer about, you know, how do I charge, right? Like, that's probably the number one question I get. Yeah. How do I charge? Do yeah. I charge hourly? Do I charge, you know, on retainer? You know, do I charge per project? Um, so it kind of started out with me just really putting out this information. Like, if you choose to charge hourly, here's a way that you can figure out your hourly rate. Um, I recommend you try to get on retainer because that's how you know you have consistent money coming in. Um, there are questions about portfolio, right? Because that's something else I'm seeing is I am offering job opportunities to these women because people have started coming to me and they're like, hey, we see what you're doing. We want to hire a black woman for this role. Um, you know, do you have someone who is a graphic designer, right? So then I will have people come to me and I need to make sure that all the freelancers know, hey, if you're bidding for this job, you need to have a portfolio that's polished, um, you need to have some writing samples, you need to have something packaged together so that this company will choose you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just all of those like little things that you need to know that you may not necessarily know when you're starting out. Um, and if you go full-time, right? Like I'm a full-time freelancer. Um, I don't have a company paying my health insurance. What do you do? You know what I mean? Yeah. You get on exchange, okay? <laughs> you get some insurance. It's not going to be very cheap, right? But I mean, if it's important to you, which is important to me, then you'll make that investment. So it is a community of sharing. Um, I like to say we share tips, tools, resources, and we are creating a pipeline, a hiring pipeline along the way. Um, so it's really just sharing information, hiring each other for opportunities that pop up. Um, you know, if someone you know, needs a web designer, like I have sourced within the BFF network to design my new website, to design my new logo. It's just, it's a community. And that's, that's really what I want to focus on for right now is continuing to grow that community. So I love it. I love that. Um, Cause we do, we need each other. We need each other's support. Sometimes, you know, we just need to hear somebody else say, yeah, girl, me too. I yeah. understand. Or I've had that experience or this is how I've won. Yeah. Um, or, you know, this is how I lost and what I learned. Yes. Um, and it'll help you to be able to navigate that, that, uh, the system of free, you know, freelance. It's, it's completely different. It almost sometimes, it, you know, it feels like you're an employee because you're going somewhere every day or you're doing work for a particular company all the time. But at the same time, like I said, it's, it's not, you're not, you're, you're your own um, entity. So different. do you, um, do you advise women? How do you advise us to uh, to compete in that space and to like be seen and be heard and to win the contracts? Other than, I mean, I know you talked about pricing, but just, you know, outside of that. Yeah, I find a lot of it. Um, and, you know, I feel like you learn as you go, right? I feel like everything you do, you kind of do a little something. I'm like, oh, that doesn't work. But, oh, this, this works. And one thing that I think that I've learned over time is that, one of the biggest things that we deal with as Black women is actually confidence. Confidence that we actually have the skills that it takes to go out and do this. Yeah. It's really because I was talking to somebody recently and I can't even remember who it is. So I hope she will forgive me if, if I don't mention her name, but she says something to the effect of, you know, we work at, let's say a corporation for 10, 15 years, and then you leave your job and you decide you want to freelance and then you think you have to start all over. No, you have 15 years of managing yeah. brand of doing accounting, of doing design or whatever you were doing, right? So I think a lot of it I've seen is really just making sure that we are confident in what we have to offer. Mm -hmm. I think confidence starts with clarity. That has been my biggest thing. If you're not clear, yeah, yeah. confidence starts with clarity. I like that. I really, really believe that. And that has been one of my challenges, right? And I try to be as transparent as possible through this journey because I am not perfect, right? Like I just thought that this was an opportunity that we need each other and I created it. I am not the authority in freelancing because it's such a unique space and it's a growing space, right? With the pandemic now. Mm -hmm. But I do also want to show people like I'm gaining my confidence every day. You know, I've had to go back to my business model with what I do in, in my work, which is content-wise communications. And I've had to get super, super, super narrow on what kind of work I'm doing for people. You know, in the beginning, I was taking everything. Like, I'm just the hodgepodge. Like, people come to me like, 
oh, I need social media. Like, oh, I need a press release. Like that's all comms, right? But that's, those are different types of comms. Very different. And Very I different. do all of it, you know, at the same level. Um, so I think just gaining that confidence through that clarity has been the thing that um, I've learned and that I'm also just trying to share with other people um, and just inspiration. You know? I love that confidence brings clarity. I, like, I feel like I need to write that down because, um, or you said clarity breeds confidence. Yes. Because yes. if you don't know who you are, Absolutely. if you don't know what you have to offer, if you don't know your value in the marketplace, you'll get ate up in this, in, in not just the freelance game, but even in corporate, you'll get ate up. Um, I just had a, uh, I forgot the name of the magazine that reached out to me and asked me to uh, comment on why women don't like the, the pay gate, the gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they wanted me, me to comment on why I felt that um, it existed. How can women overcome that and things like that. And I said exactly what you just said. It's really about knowing your worth yeah. and standing on it. And in the freelance world, what I learned a little I won't say too late, but mm -hmm. I'll say later in the game is the art of negotiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you know what you have to offer and, you know, I, I have proven results. I have my portfolio. I have my resume. I have references. I have everything that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it gives me a place to leverage and say, hey, if you want, if you want this quality of work, if you want, you know, me. Absolutely. And my expertise, you got to, you know, kick in a little bit. You can't Absolutely. just take anything and everything. And I think so many times as Black women, I can speak to my experience. We, um, we've always been taught that we have to be twice as good to get half as much. Mm -hmm. And as much as that has helped us to excel mm -hmm. and, you know, we're degreed and we're doing all these great things now. It has also crippled us because we feel like we have to go above and beyond and do all these things. And then everybody else around us is halfway mediocre <laughs> and they're making more money than us. Straight mediocre. And that's one of my themes is like charge your worth and then add tax, right? Because on top of the experience that you bring, on top of the result that you bring, you know, you bring the research that you have to do. If you have to contract out, you can't, you got to make sure you're paying for those people, right? Like it's not just the time that we're working on this project, right? It's the whole process. It is the years of me learning how to project manage myself that yeah. you are getting <laughs> because you're not hiring a freelancer that doesn't know how to manage your time, right? Like I know how to manage several clients at this time and still get your project done efficiently and, you know, to your liking, so I think that's part of it too. It is, it is confidence. <laughs> it all goes back to confidence for me, like confidence in what we have to offer and who we are. Um, and just knowing that and, and not blinking when we ask for those big figures. Not blinking. Mm -mm. <laughs> like, yes. Surprise. <laughs> Here you go. This is, this is yes. In, I'll invoice you. Thank you. <laughs> so tell me. <laughs> What do you do at, con you said at first that you were kind of all over the place on social media and press releases and this and that and da, 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 da. What have you narrowed your niche down to at this point? What do you love to do? Yeah, so I think my sweet spot is I work specifically with nonprofits, churches, social entrepreneurs to help develop brand messaging and communication strategies. Mm -hmm. so I work with social impact organizations that I consider, you know, social impact, because those are values that I have. I want to do that kind of work. Um, and I help them get clear. You know, a lot of times our nonprofits, our churches, you know, their communications can be scattered. They don't have a huge, you know, communications team like your major Fortune 500 company may have. Um, so again, my whole thing is clarity. How can I come in and help you get clear on who you are in the messages that you're putting out into the world so you can more effectively go and put those messages into the world. Um, so that's my sweet spot. And that is the kind of work that I've been doing. And that is where I have flourished, right? And it took me a long time to get to this place. Um, it took me years of freelancing and doing everything, doing the Hodge project work, but this is where I'm comfortable and, and where I bring the most value. 
I love that. Yeah. I used to uh, work in ministry and then I also had, you know, nonprofit clients. So I totally concur with you. Yeah. Um, sometimes it is, it's a number of reasons that it happens in those spaces, what you just said, the lack of clarity, um, you know, projects being strewn about, you know, people chasing, um, <laughs> chasing the next flashlight or the flashy thing, you know, it's like, oh, let me, let's do this because this other organization did that, or look at what this church is doing. So let us do, you know, do this. And um, yeah. I think that for organizations such as those with a social impact, they have to stay focused on the mission of what they want to accomplish. Absolutely. <laughs> if they don't, it's all over the place. And you know, and I think I think a couple of things. One, I think that also any business that is nonprofit, and I've worked in nonprofit and I've worked in corporate, any business that's nonprofit in 2021 that's still only relying on donations needs to change their model. Like I feel very, very strongly in that. Everybody needs to be able to get out here and get it for themselves, right? And not have their handout waiting for donations. Like there are all kinds of, of businesses that have been nonprofits that are spinning ways to, you know, sell their services in some kind of way, sell training, sell something, right? So I think going through the process of the brand messaging, the communication strategy also helps them to see like, hey, you can actually, I was just watching, um, I don't know if you watch High on the Hog on Netflix. Yes, yes. Amazing. Amazing. But when they got to Texas, they had that church that had a barbecue joint. Yeah. Like, I thought that was genius. I like, thought it was cool. And I wanted to actually go. And then, then at the end, they were like, oh, it closed after I was here. I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I just, I think that that's really important. You know what I mean? That, that um, all of these organizations, we all have to figure out how to get out here and work in this new economy, right? The, the mm -hmm. internet has, technology has provided new opportunities for all of us. So I wanna help these kind of organizations tap into that. So what kind of, what kind of uh, I guess, social impact ventures or um, causes are you really passionate about? Yeah, I'm passionate about all things Black people. <laughs> Black Lives Matter, okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, number one, um, I'm really passionate about women's rights. Um, you know, I know I don't want to get political and controversial, but I'm a Planned Parenthood supporter. You know what I mean? I think the, yeah. the work that they do is incredibly important and it's painted like it's just one thing and it's not just one thing, right? Like there's a lot of work that they're doing. I used to go to Planned Parenthood when I was young and I needed their services very much when I was younger in college and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you're right. It does get painted as the abortion clinic, which I'm like, okay, no, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, black people and women, that's, you know, I, uh, those are the things that I love. Um, I mentioned to you before we hopped on the call that I used to live in the Philippines for two years. Yeah. Um, and I actually worked for the United Methodist church. I grew up Methodist here in Dallas. Um, and I actually worked for the Methodist church when I went there. Mm -hmm. um, so I still keep in touch. I still have friends there. Like a lot of my work was like activist based work for climate justice or women's organizations or poverty organizations there. So I will say I still am in touch with a lot of those people and those people are still my friends and like any way that I can support them as well. Like those are causes I feel really close to because I spent that time there. So I like that. I like that. So when people, here, here's another thing that I, because I, I have been looking at this for my own um, business, mm -hmm. um, setting up a B Corporation. So, mm -hmm. you know, B Corporations are really there for, for social impact. I know like Ben, ben & Jerry's, yep. um, it's a couple other large brands that have a B Corporation status. Um, and they really, you know, they use the funds and they champion causes. And so how mm -hmm. would you advise, I mean, you're, you're in this space, mm -hmm. um, anybody or even me, I don't know, whoever mm -hmm. is watching, mm -hmm. if they are really passionate about something, because sometimes, and I'll be honest in my own, you know, business, I'm very passionate about the same things that you're passionate about. Like hands down, if it's got something to do with black people and women and don't let it be black women, like I'm all over it. <laughs> so, 
so <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, um, sign me up, put my name on on the roll, we going. Um, but sometimes business owners, especially small business owners, mm-hmm. are afraid to marry their their uh, social mm-hmm. justice causes and things like that with their businesses because they don't want their businesses to mm-hmm. um, bear the brunt if if mm-hmm. you know anything controversial happens. So how do you you know, how do you balance the two? Yeah. Well, I, one, I think it depends on what kind of business you have, you know, cause some businesses like they don't need to be, they don't need to take a side, you know what I mean? So I think it depends first on, on what kind of business that you have. Um, but for, for me, like being a communications company, right? Like I choose to work with causes, you know or organizations that I like, like I'm not gonna go work for a cigarette company, right? Because I don't believe in that. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's enough work for me over here that I don't need to take that kind of work. So <clears throat> I think it's figuring out what kind of work you do. Um, and then also, I think you'll see that trends are starting to show that like, hey, you got to pick a side and consumers are kind of demanding that people take a side. Right. Um, I think Ben and Jerry's, you brought them up like they do an amazing job. Right. I love them. If y'all watching, (laughs) seriously, I love y'all. Like I'm so serious. Every time they come out with a statement, and it is so bold, and it's so like on target, it's unapologetic. Right. It's like, look, this is what we're saying. You wrong, or like this ain't right. We don't stand for this. It's just like plain as day. Tom's is the other one I was thinking about. Uh Patagonia is a B Corp and they're yeah. really into like environment, right? So I think that by making those stances, I think you further endear yourself to the people who love your brand, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you are someone who loves the environment and you want to go to Patagonia and their jacket is $100, but you can get one at Target for 40 like because you believe in their values, you're still going to buy that Patagonia jacket, right? So that's brand loyalty. Like you can't, gloss over the fact that your values also start to play into brand loyalty to your company. Um, and I like that. I am like, I will go into the store and I'll get that Ben and Jerry's. Okay. That's me. I got support. That's me all day long. It's certain organizations and companies that won't get a dime out of me Same. because it's certain things that I see them doing and I'm like, Mm-mm, y'all ain't getting none of my money. But it's some that I will pay the premium because I know that they, you know, that they're doing good mm-hmm. and that they stand behind what they say they stand behind. And um, I just, you're right. It does create brand loyalty, especially for people who are conscious consumers. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you don't want to, if you, you know, you a person that loves animals and you don't want to do, you know, real leather or whatever, like, you know, people are like that. And so, yeah. um, I love that you said that because it, it takes the it takes the fear away mm-hmm. from choosing a side. Because back in the day, you know, you watch a McDonald's commercial or you watch whatever on TV and it was just like a neutral message, come buy our stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think last year, especially, I mean, it already was happening. It was already like, you know, boiling underneath. But I think last year Absolutely. really set the tone for you to, you know, for a social impact to uh, to come to the forefront and also for, um, you know, that social responsibility within a lot of companies to come to the forefront. Because you couldn't just sit there and watch, you know, George Floyd on the ground for nine minutes and say, oh, I didn't see that. Like, you couldn't just turn, yeah. your, <laughs> turn your head and say, oh, buy our french fries. Like, no, nah, you got to... <laughs> Super, and I think last year was super interesting because I feel like it ignited a flame for support for Black businesses. Like I, I literally wrote an article on conscious consumerism because I'm still a freelance writer. Like that's just something I will always do. Um, not long ago, and I wrote it for a a bank. It was a bank client, and they had like their own blog, and they were very interested in, you know, corporate social responsibility, in you know, social responsibility, and they were. So I put this article together. So I did a bunch of research and I got to a piece where I wanted to talk about the support for black businesses. And I found a stat that said last year in June of 2020, 
uh, searches for black businesses on Google went up by 300%, you know? Um, and I think we're still feeling that energy, right? For yeah. whatever reason, the world finally woke up and realized we have black businesses, right? But, um, you know, now there is a resurgence, you know, to really support black businesses, you know, after the tragedy that happened. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's these things, they kind of go in waves. I mean, what I think is most important, even with the whole conscious consumerism, you know, social responsibility conversation is that how do we really hold these brands accountable to make sure they're not just posting a black square on one day. Yes. They, they're not just celebrating Juneteenth last year. Where's your energy for this weekend? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, where, where are all of these things? Like, we also have to continue to hold these people accountable for the way they treat black people, right? And how they show up for their black consumers. So I agree. I agree a hundred percent. I um I had posted something a couple months ago. It was probably if it wasn't the beginning of 2021, it was like the end of 2020. And I said, who is tracking? Because you know, these companies pledged, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A pledge is, you know, listen, people pledge to the church building fund and don't <laughs> honor their play right they're like oh i'll play a hundred dollars and then they gave twenty dollars because they was excited that sunday and then the other 80 we don't know where we don't know if it's coming or not and so it's like how how are we keeping up with yeah the promises that were made and based upon um you know how much was pledged the money that was put because sometimes you know it's easy to throw money at a situation yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to just say, oh, we'll write a check for $10 million, but your company is a hundred billion dollar company. <laughs> right. Like mm-hmm. mm, that's like pennies. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. It is. But what, how are we tracking the, the true efficacy of these campaigns? And like you said, so that it's not just a black square on one day that went up, but it's actual true change. And to circle back to the beginning of our conversation, when black women show up in these spaces and honestly that is more so what i think about like y'all can place that money give all your money give it to the hbcs please give it to hampton <laughs> yes do that <laughs> hampton. um but you know also how are you treating your black employees right like i have lots of friends that work in corporations who you know are kind of dealing with these things firsthand are in these brgs are you know seeing if leadership is authentic or not so it's like how are we matriculating you know our black employees through our company because at the end of the day right there's only still right now two black women that are ceos of i think four to five hundred companies and one like they both just kind of got there like within the last year yep so those are the things that i want to see i want to see more opportunities for black people in all spaces especially black women you know? absolutely absolutely like i said if it's anything about us i'm all for it if you're gonna uplift us yeah. let's go yeah. um, but don't don't do it for show yeah yeah don't do it as charity yeah um don't label it entitlement mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i had a conversation Uh, via email with someone and I think this is a perfect opportunity for for me to air the conversation that was had because it was very it left me feeling a way I'm not gonna lie I I had to like Mm -hmm. close my eyes and breathe after the conversation so Mm -hmm. um, I met someone on LinkedIn and on this particular person's profile they said that they were helping black owned businesses. Um, I don't know if it was like helping black owned businesses with capital or helping, helping black startups or it was some something in the headline. Mm-hmm. And so when I saw it, I said, oh, wow. Okay, let me see what he's about. Caucasian man, older gentleman. Mm-hmm. And so I sent him a message and I said, hey, you know, I'm trying to you know, get to know the people that I'm connected to. I saw that you were, you know, passionate about Black-owned businesses, so am I. So I just wanted to reach out and see what it is that you're doing to help us and, you know, see Mm -hmm. if there's any synergy between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And his 
immediate message back to me was, we're a group of badasses that don't sit around and talk about racism, injustice, and entitlements, but we get work done. What does that mean? <laughs> Whoa. So, I mean, like, it wasn't like a, hey, thanks for reaching out. You know, I'd love to talk. To it was none of that. That was his first paragraph. <laughs> Yeah. And it, it, it set me back for a minute. And I said, wow, I said, your language is a bit strong. And it is, uh, what did I say? It's, um, basically I said, it's not sensitive to the lived experiences of the people that you say you're, you're here to serve. So what led you to want to help black owned businesses? Like I love, and I said, I love to, you know, chat with you, get on Zoom or whatever. I'm just trying to learn what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I'm not really sympathetic to people. It sounds like a troll on LinkedIn. <laughs> like, what? So I bring that up in this conversation to say that there are so many people that are using the, uh, the cloak of social responsibility, mm -hmm. of helping Black-owned businesses, or helping any cause, right? It doesn't have to just be black owned businesses. It could be helping women. It could be helping um, mm -hmm. animals. I don't care, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people that are using these phrases and terms and you know keywords and all that other good stuff mm -hmm. and they're benefiting from it mm -hmm. rather than having the true heart and the altruism to really make change and help. And so, um, I wanted yeah. to bring that up and then bring, you know, toss it to you to see if you have seen that in any any form or fashion as you're working in social responsibility spaces. Yeah, and I think that that's tough. That brings up an interesting point for me because and I and I'll ask it back to you. Do you think it is if black let's say women specifically because we both really care about black women. If black women are getting opportunities even if it is opportunistic on this side mm. how do you feel about that come on i love this i love this ah! yes okay this is see this is where this is what a rubber piece of road so and were you listen listen you sound like you were a debate student like i was <laughs> Okay, I was on the debate team. So when you like live debate, me, I'm like, ooh, this is good. So for me, mm -hmm. no, I have a problem with that. I, I, I really have a problem. Um, I really have a problem with people being opportunistic in spaces that are sensitive to things that I'm that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. To me, it's almost like um, like go back to like slavery days, right? Mm -hmm. And if it was somebody that was around, like we'll set, the, let's go set the slaves free, like a white person. And I'm like, oh, let's set the slaves free. Mm -hmm. but we know that for every slave that we set free, we'll make $10. So they're really doing it for the $10, right? It's like, right. I don't really care about them. Right, right, right. I just really want the $10. Right. I, something about that just doesn't sit right with me personally. Now, I know a lot of people that are like, I don't care if he can give me the money and he can give me the funding for my business. I don't care if he, you know, really don't care or he's racist or he's supporting, you know, taking his money and supporting mm -hmm. the, uh, what you call them people, the people that went to the Capitol or whatever, you know, like, mm -hmm. but for me, I feel like it's all a part of one system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're, you're feeding off of the system in the name of justice. Mm -hmm. And then you take your money and you go and you spend it in, or, you know, you take your vote or whatever, and you use that against me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong, but that's just how I think. So. So for me, the way I look at it is I kind of look at, <clears throat> I look at history and time as like a scale, right? And I think that we tend to, there's this book called The Fourth Turning. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's really interesting, but it talks about how we look at like bite sizes of time, like four years, like such and such was president for four years. Oh no. But like in reality, like four years, four years, you know, hundred years yeah. is like not that big of a deal, right? Yeah. So I look at 
the, the world where we are right now, like we are in scales. And for a long time, here were white people up here, right? And here were black people. And this is what is happening, right? And this is why we're storming the Capitol and we're getting nervous and like we're toting guns without permits. And it's like doing like this, right? So to me, whether you're doing it to be opportunistic, if I take your seed money and I start the next Amazon because black people create the culture, I'm gonna take that money and I'm gonna invest it in my business because I'm smart and I know that I'm gonna take that money and I'm gonna turn it into a lot more than what it was when I got it, you know what I mean? So I think that if black people are getting opportunities, if, if venture capital funds and all of these places that are getting money are starting to realize like, you know, we need to be giving money to black people, you do, come on, give it on over to our community and let us do something with it. Let us continue this movement of black businesses supporting black businesses. And like, let's let's start a, a new black economy in a way that we haven't seen in a long time, right? We just celebrated the 100 year anniversary of Black Wall Street, right? And I think that that kind of energy, we're, we're, we're back in that space, right? So I just, I want the coins <laughs> to go. I, want the coins. I don't care. I don't care if they're going to give me the coins and then when I run off, they're going to, you know, shoot sure. me. The back. I want the money. Give me the money. No. <laughs> I want to start that big billion dollar business, you know? Or I like that. Someone in the Black community. I, I mean, I can I can see how it could be beneficial. I guess me yeah. in my mindset, I'm just like, mm, don't like, don't throw a rock and hide your hand. Like, I, I'm very good. I'm distrust. I'm distrusting the. And people. I hear you. And you know what's so funny though? But you, it's I was watching 60 Minutes yesterday with my parents, and they had this um, clip on about Africa Town, Alabama. I think it was mm -hmm. Alabama or it was Mississippi. I, I think it was Alabama though. I think it's and they were saying, Alabama. Yeah, and it was like the first free town that Africans like had founded. Yep. And um, the people that had owned the slaves there, like the white family, like they could trace them down. And now this white family owned like a business that was worth like 40 or $50 million. And the, you know, the reporters kept reaching out to them like, oh, can we get an interview with you? and all of them turn it down. I'm like, of course they turn it down because they realize that they are in their position because uh, of yeah. their ancestors enslaving black people back then and giving them that head start to make that kind of money, right? So yeah. I think it's just all of, I think of money as like the, the leveler um, of all people. Yeah. And I think access to capital and you know recreating that capital, right? Like investing that money, not just spending the money, reinvesting it into things, I think money is, is the great equalizer because this is America. <laughs> I do agree with that. Absolutely. I, um, yeah, I think, you know, go out, protest, make your voice heard, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Me now, like me, maybe 10 years ago, I had the energy and the stamina and all of that stuff. And I would be out there screaming, hollering and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm like, okay, I'm in the background. Like, how can I be strategic? <laughs> Absolutely. Like you said, how can I get this coin and what can I do with this coin to get, you know, and then how can I help somebody else get, you know, so that's where I do agree um, mm -hmm. that without money and without these businesses, and this is, you know, going to circle back to another point, and without our businesses being strong in our community yeah. um, and not being threatened, you you mentioned the uh, you know massacre in Tulsa and all that other stuff, and now it's more strategic, it's more underlying, it's more you know political and policy and all of that stuff that's happening. Less you know, I'm just going in to bomb somebody. Mm -hmm. But um, once we're strong in that space and we you know we get our businesses, if we could just get to the point of understanding how to coalesce with one another. Absolutely. and help one another um Absolutely. money talks yeah. money talks at the end of the day you know is is it just is what it is and so um i do agree that that money is the great equalizer and it is what it's gonna bring it ain't, it ain't about me getting out here you know hollering and screaming in somebody's face yeah it's really about uh you know bringing us to a level of parity economic yeah. parity 100 100 believe that you know. i have loved this conversation you you know it's, it's few times that i talk to people that i am mentally stimulated 
And like I said, I love the back and forth because I don't get that a lot of times when I'm talking to people. It's just really a lot of times just, you know, conversation. It's just whatever. Yeah. But you you just made me think. And now I have to go back and, and put my uh, my thoughts or my feelings around that to question and see. Hmm. That's, that was good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyway, so tell me what it is that you're currently working on. How can people get involved, especially with the BFF network? I love that it's BFF. You know, I, I think that it has a double entendre. Um, but, you know, tell us what you're working on. Yeah, so I am working to grow the BFF network. Um, like I said, it is my passion. Um, and not only is my passion, I just feel so much energy around it because I know that it is needed. You know, in the short time that I've been doing it, I've gotten the sweetest messages from strangers, black women around the world who have told me like, this is such a needed platform, right? And that's the kind of thing that keeps me going every single day is knowing that like, I am building the community that, that I was lacking, right? And I need that kind of community. I want to be around more entrepreneurs. I want to be around more Black women creating and building things, right? Um, and so I, I had to create that for myself. So I'm glad to just be creating this network. Um, to tap in, we are on Instagram at BFFNTWRK. Um, if you type in Black female freelancers on Instagram, we'll be the first thing that pops up. Um, and from there, I just encourage everyone to sign up for my email list. Um, my email is, uh, I have a newsletter called Against the Grain, uh, and that means she who does the thing that is not expected of her. Um, that is what the email is about, you know, and um, that's where real updates are going to come for the BFF network. I am honestly, I'm looking for some very, very early seed um, money to help me get to an MVP. I have a site idea that I really want to build out. Um, because the goal for the BFF network is to create a pipeline, a talent pipeline for brands and companies to specifically hire Black women, but also for Black women to be a training resource platform so you can go up and you can get these jobs against the other freelancers that are out there in the world, on your fibers, on your Upworks or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that is that is what I'm doing. And, you know, if, if it resonates with you, Come give us a follow and let's connect. Well, it resonates with me. And so I got a couple of resources that I want to talk to you after. after yes, I would love live. Um, Cause yeah, this is, I'm telling you, you're on, you're really on to something. Yeah. Um, sometimes people are on to something and they don't realize that they're really on to something. Yeah. But you are really, really and truly on to something. And I feel that in my spirit. I really genuinely do. Yeah, you really, really are. Um, like I said, I freelanced for, oh my God, years. And years. it's hard. <laughs> and, and that's one thing I try to tell people. I am not glorifying freelancing as everyone needs to go out and quit your job and become a freelancer. Like freelancing is hard. It's a gateway though. It's a tool. It's it a tool is. to get you to that next level. It is. And I, I will say that um for me I appreciate my time as a freelancer and honestly I've thought about it like doing it again kind of on the side yeah. um I've appreciated my time as a freelancer because it helped me to cut my teeth as an entrepreneur it helped me to think outside of the system of working for someone where everything is just laid out in a manual and this is what you do and this is how you you know play in this space yeah um and so I appreciate I appreciate my time being a freelancer. I appreciate other freelancers because I hire freelancers in my agency. Um, and I just think I, it's a great, I mean, listen, I, you're on to something. That's all I can say, especially with us. Yes. Especially with us specifically. Um, the, the first three, four, four letters of that word is free. Yes. And uh, being a freelancer actually helped me to become a free person. So I appreciate it. So anywho, um, y'all know how to reach her. She's already told you now, if you are a freelancer, if you're a black woman, or if you want to get into the space of freelancing, you don't know how to, or you, you know, you're a little afraid to dip your, your toe into the pool. 
um, go ahead and reach out to Laura. I'm sure she has some resources, some encouragement, something for you. And, and I also just want to add really quick. Also, if you're a business and you're looking to hire freelancers, we have been oh. really connecting people. We've been connecting writers, designers, web pe people that do websites. So like, if you need a freelancer for your business, I would love to talk to you too. Well, we, like I said, we're going to talk offline because I, I have, you have my mind kind of like going right now. Um, resources for you and then resources for me. So this is what this is about, y'all. This is what the Bright Girls in Business podcast, the Bright Girls in Business Facebook group is all about. It's about connecting, building, and sharing with one another. And so I am so thankful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Laura, for spending your evening a piece of your evening with me. Um, and like I say, every week, we'll be back next week on Monday with a whole nother woman entrepreneur who will be here to share her story and her perspective. So make sure that you are back here in your seat, tuned in to the YouTube channel at 6 p.m. Central. All right, until next week, y'all stay successful and y'all be blessed.